I mean, I, I don't think that anyone would really argue with the fact that we, I mean, these are, these are quite remarkable times. The fact that, um, um, you know, there are record numbers of independent candidates mm. who have decided to stand forth and motivated by Gaza, but actually calling for radical change in, in British politics. So many people are now saying, you know, we can't continue this cyclical thing about the two parties, either or, which are essentially the same. I'm guessing that yourself, um, I mean, that's the, that's the motivator for why you're standing. Is that correct? It's certainly a big part of the motivation for why I'm standing. Um, I see no difference between them. Mm. They're all offering us, or both are offering us a sort of a combination of permanent austerity and forever wars mm. and all of the consequences of those things. And this isn't choice. Mm. You know, for representative democracy to work, two things have to happen. There's got to be choice because that's, those, that's the basic underpinning of a democratic system. If you're just voting for a whole lot of things that are the same, you're not being given choice. The second thing is obviously that people are informed. And at the moment, you don't have that sense. You have the sense that, that people, there's an attempt to keep people as ignorant as possible about what is going on in the world and particularly in Gaza, but even the impact that has on our economy. And then the other thing is that, you know, representative democracy should mean what it says on the tin. People should be of their communities, mm. And they should represent those communities. If you look at our MPs in this country, how many of them actually represent their constituents and how many of them represent their billionaire donors or their own personal interests mm. and ambitions? And I think the system is just completely out of kilter now. I mean, the fact that now we've had almost 14 years of Tory rule. I mean, the first four years were with the co yeah. in a coalition with the Lib Dems, but 14 years since we've had a Labour government, mm. every poll that I'm looking at suggests that Labour will come back, some suggesting with a landslide victory. Um, surely a change of government, theoretically at least, should change things. I well, mean, you'd well, think and, that with Tories out, austerity and all of that, yeah. And Labour coming in, things should be well, looking on the up. Let's have a look at it in all honesty. Mm -hmm. Labour have agreed to the Tories' fiscal plans, which means they can't do anything. They've agreed to increasing the defence budget. They want to limit immigration. Mm -hmm. They want to keep the two-child benefit cap. I mean, if you can distinguish any difference between Sunak or Starmer's approach to the genocide in Gaza, then please tell me because I can't. Mm. Even though the one's supposed to be a human rights lawyer, or at least was at some point, mm. doesn't seem to have had any impact on his levels of humanity. Mm. Very happy to continue to sell British weapons to Israel. Will it make a difference because the tie of the person standing at the dispatch box has changed? Mm. Is that going to make a difference? That's not what political difference is about anymore. And I think that for ordinary people in this country, you know, there's a reason that Labour's slogan is change mm. because people are desperate for change. The Tories have been corrupt, inept, incompetent, I mean, let's not forget, you know, the realities of Boris Johnson, the realities of Liz Truss, if anyone still remembers her, who served for five minutes that cost the taxpayer £74 billion. And now Rishi Sunak, you know, a billionaire banker who has shown his only interest to be his own political survival. And now that he realizes he can't survive, is just basically taking the whole ship down with him. And this should have happened years ago. The difficulty was that the establishment couldn't let someone assume office in this country who would have threatened them 
And when I say threaten the establishment, what I mean by that is two things primarily. The first is threaten them economically. So be willing to impose a wealth tax. Be willing to reduce the defense budget not renew nuclear deterrent missiles that are going to cost us well over 200 billion pounds and actually focus on investing more in saving the climate, investing more in the NHS, investing more in benefits in our care systems, investing more in our schools. And then on the other hand, someone who is highly critical of Israel and highly critical of the British establishment's foreign policy, which has failed decade after decade after decade, resulting in the deaths of millions of people around the world, mm. particularly in the Middle East, about which they seem to care not a jot. Mm. So when Jeremy Corbyn was actually on the cusp of power, he came within a few thousand votes of actually assuming office. There was complete panic in the establishment. You had soldiers on practice rangers firing at photographs of Jeremy Corbyn. You had military generals saying publicly that maybe if he assumed office, there would have to be a coup. Oh. So now we have a candidate in Labour who the establishment feels very comfortable with, and they've put a huge amount of money behind him because they feel so comfortable with him and because they know nothing is going to change. There won't be a wealth tax. There won't be investment in the things that people actually need. There'll be much more privatization of the NHS, which of course makes them lots of money. So what we're getting with Keir Starmer is exactly what we're getting with Rishi Sunak in a slightly different package. Permanent austerity, forever wars, mm. and the climate and socioeconomic consequences of that. You know, have they spoken about social or council housing? I mean, it, it, it's astonishing how many things they don't speak about. Mm. And then when they speak about the important things, there is no content. Yeah. And they're both, and I'm afraid to say, and it really pains me to say this, they're both a reflection of our mendacious, mediocre, incompetent, mm. and corrupt politics. And the corruption which I could talk far more about because that's what I do for my day job is I investigate and expose political corruption is key to the way in which Gaza affects the daily lives mm. of people on the ground in this country. So we subsidize the weapons makers in this country, BAE Systems, Rolls-Royce, Kinetic, but also foreign companies like Raytheon, which is an American company, or Elbit Systems, which is an Israeli company that has at least seven factories in this country. It used to be 10, but Palestine Action did away with three of them, caused them to close three of them down. Through Ministry of Defense contracts, through subsidies for research and development, through support with marketing across the world, through our embassies, with people employed full time to sell their weapons, we are subsidizing these companies to the tunes of tens of billions of pounds. And that's in addition to our defense budget, which itself runs into tens of billions of pounds. These are our tax pounds. When you speak to people, yeah. when you speak to people, yeah. and you tell them all these things, do they, I mean, when you're talking about the government yeah. and its foreign policy, someone who's suffering in terms of their housing, someone who's, you know, on a waiting list for months, waiting Absolutely. for an MRI. I mean, what, does so it I matter tell you to how them? It, I tell you how it does matter to them. When I then say to them, well, you know, 40% of all corruption in the world takes place in the global arms trade. Mm. So when we sell weapons to Israel, it's not just Netanyahu and the military leaders who are being bribed. Mm. And they literally, they're paid corrupt money. Mm. And that's why Netanyahu is not so keen on the independent judicial system. But some of those bribes come back. They come back to our country in the form of donations to the major political parties and to our individual politicians. But most importantly, most importantly, this is money that should be invested in our NHS, mm. should be invested in our schools. And instead, we are effectively using our tax pounds to support what Israel is doing in Gaza mm. 
And when it comes to social and council housing, where there's a massive need just for more housing stock or for repairs to take place in my own area, I have people coming to talk to me who say they've been asking for repairs for eight, nine years. That's what the money should be used on. And that's when people get very interested in it. Mm -hmm. And they start to see the connections between these things. We normally start from the other side, mm -hmm. from the side of the issues they're facing on the ground, mm -hmm. and then bring in the sort of the foreign wars and the adventures and the foreign policy. But I think the links between these things are really important because basically what we're doing with our tax pounds, we are not just subsidizing a genocide that we're seeing before our eyes being committed against the people of Gaza and Palestine. That's just part of it. We are also subsidizing the corruption of our own political system. So we're watching the system being corrupted and we're paying for it. Mm. And when you put it in those terms to people, they get very interested. I was in an area today in Kentish town, mm. a wonderful market that's there every day. Yes. A lot of um, people from the Bangladeshi community, from the Somali communities, and we were talking about all of these things and they were all saying, but hang on, why are we voting for someone who's going to do all of this stuff? And I said, well, that's the problem. That's what's been happening. And they say, but how come we don't know about this stuff? Mm. And I was saying to them, well, because the mainstream media doesn't cover it. Yeah. Mm. So all of a sudden what you're doing is um, that NHS waiting list becomes so intrinsically tied to arming Israel. It becomes all one and within the same package. Of course, you have the issue of, yeah, I mean, you're putting it in, let's say, crude financial terms. Yeah. But there's the issue of morality also. I mean, someone, a government or a minister who okays the selling of weapons that go to kill innocent people, such as we've seen in Gaza mm -hmm. time and time and time again, um, couldn't truly be trusted with running our NHS or looking after our children or looking after our not. public services. Yeah. No, that's an incredibly good point. You know, it's about the morality, not just of our politicians, but of our politics. Mm. If we have, I, I remember a situation, I used to come to this country because I'm from South Africa. I used to come to this country with my parents when I was younger. And I've always been fascinated by politics. And you would see somebody who would lie in the House of Commons. And that would be the end of their political career. If that were the case now, there'd be maybe five or six people left in the House of Commons. Sure. Because it's become accepted and standard. Yeah. So, you know, from a moral basis, my own MP, who is leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, mm -hmm. he won election by specifically committing to 10 pledges. Mm. And he took those basically from Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto because yeah. he knew that Jeremy was still yeah. very popular. And he said, I'm going to continue <clears throat> these policies. Mm. And as soon as he was elected, he then set about violating almost all of them. Is this the basis mm. on which we want to elect a new prime minister? Mm. You know, to be honest with you, I don't expect much better of the Tories. Yeah. A party that could elect Boris Johnson as its leader, where Boris Johnson has lost, I don't know how many jobs it is, yeah. because he actually lied in those jobs. I mean, as a journalist, he made up interviews. True. And then the party goes and elects someone like that leader. You know, sure, then we should know better. Mm. And yeah, he might come across as funny and you know, that sort of mop of hair and everything. But we saw when he was faced with serious issues, how completely, completely inappropriate he as a personality was for that job. Liz Truss was so bad at it that they got rid of her within, you know, below 50 days. Rishi Sunak was effectively the last man standing. Mm. He, he got it at the third time of trying because there was no one else left and he imploded just like the rest of them. And I mean, we shouldn't forget that his father-in-law, who runs a huge technology company, you know, when there were sanctions placed against Russia, of course, that company was allowed to continue to do business. But the Labour Party is supposed to stand for something different. It's supposed to stand with working people 
and their trade unions. It's supposed to stand with minority communities, with BAME communities in this country. That's who has been the bedrock of its support for so long. And it's supposed to stand for some sort of values. Mm. That started to be undermined with when Tony Blair was in office, obviously, the invasion of Iraq, mm. which we now know he lied about to Parliament. And that was the beginning of the Labour Party deciding it was fine to lie to Parliament to defend ourselves. And, you know, someone like Alistair Campbell yeah. took great pride in the fact he, uh, that he would force the media to lie. He would be so aggressive with them and say, well, if you never want to get access to this government again, yeah. don't print this, but I'm telling you, you're going to print this. Mm. So that was the way our politics became. Mm. And then we had Jeremy Corbyn and suddenly we thought, oh, maybe there's a different way of doing politics. And now we have Keir Starmer, who I would argue is even more nakedly mm. on the sort of mendacious, mediocre side of politics, who is consciously lying all the time and changing his positions constantly so that nobody has any idea what he stands for. And, you know, on an issue that's very important to me, as, as someone who worked for Nelson Mandela, on issues of race. I mean, I actually think today the Labour Party has a racism problem. Yeah. And to say that of my own MP in a progressive constituency like Hoban and St Pancras, to say that of the leader of the Labour Party, mm. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought about it for two seconds if it was a conservative leader. Yeah. This is the leader of the Labour Party and somehow... And a human rights lawyer. You know, and a uh, human rights lawyer. And, you know, someone who, first of all, and now, of course, he denies ever having said it, but we have the video evidence, which he doesn't seem to really understand social media particularly well. But the reality is somebody who agreed that it was acceptable for Israel to withhold power and water mm. from the people of Gaza, you know, that's a human rights lawyer who's lost any shred of humanity, first of all. But second of all, seems to have no principle, seems to think that anti-Semitism, and this is correct, that anti-Semitism is a very serious issue and problem, and it is. But is it any different to Islamophobia or anti-black racism or any other form of discrimination? Because to me, the only difference is, and I see, and you know, I must say this to you, and I said something of an outsider in this country, mm. because I wasn't born here. I've lived here for almost 23 years, but I've lived most of my life in South Africa, and I'm very proud of that fact. To think that one form of racism is any less or more important than another, what Martin Ford Casey described as a hierarchy, hierarchy of racism. Of racism. Yeah. You know, it was Nelson Mandela who said, you are either against every form of racism and discrimination or you are part of the racism problem. Yeah. And the issue with Islamophobia in Britain is that a lot of Islamophobia in this country mm -hmm. is actually state-driven. Yeah. And that really worries me. So as an anti-racist committed to the eradication of all racism and discrimination, I am really concerned about what a Starmer government would do mm. in relation to racism and particularly Islamophobia and anti-black racism. And, and, you know, it's, I mean, we have within society and with, even within politics, we have the far right element, we have the overtly racist um, element. Uh, thankfully, they're still a minority, um, but growing, I yeah. have to say. Um, and you would expect them to spout all sorts of yeah. racist uh, language or the such, but it becomes incredibly problematic when virtually the same kind of language is being used by the authorities, by the state, mm. by government, yeah. by officials whom you know, openly they would decry racism. They would say, oh, no, no, we are against yeah. racism or the such. But then they espouse this kind of narrative yeah. that drives forward this kind of prejudice and discrimination against, against either Muslims or blacks or Jews or whatever. It's, it's, that is the problem. But let me go back a little bit mm. to mm. your South African roots. <laughs> you were a, an MP with the ANC and you, you were close to Nelson Mandela. You knew Nelson Mandela. You met with him. Um, I saw the picture of uh, him carrying your <laughs> eldest son, which uh, I'm sure adorns uh, the walls of his uh, his house. 
Um, tell me a little bit about, about that. I mean, how, how, how did someone yeah. like yourself, if I may, I no, mean, of course. a white Jew, South African, become part of the ANC? Sure. How, how did that happen? So, you know, it starts with the sort of, and I was lucky, the sort of household I grew up in. My mom was a Holocaust survivor. Mm -hmm. She survived the Holocaust in occupied Vienna. Wow. She was hidden in a coal cellar for three and a half years. Oh. And she lost dozens of her extended family at Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. First time I went to Auschwitz, I was invited there to lecture on genocide prevention because that's my day job. I investigate and write about the global arms trade, conflict, genocide. And she met my father who was South African in London and they went back to South Africa together where my mother had never been and she didn't know what apartheid was. And she saw black South Africans being treated like the Jews of Europe had been treated and she was horrified. And she understood after the Second World War that never again applied to all humanity. So she got involved in the anti-apartheid struggle through an organization called the Black Sash. Mm. And so when I was growing up, you know, during my school holidays, I would go into townships with her or she worked, she was a puppeteer. She worked in a non-racial and illegal non-racial theater. Mm. And there were all these extraordinary people in this theater who I, of course, didn't realize. South Africa's probably greatest apartheid era playwright, a chap called Athel Fugart and, and his colleagues, John Carney and Winston Chawner, who appeared in all of his plays. A jazz musician who at the time was known as Dollar Brand and then converted to Islam and changed his name to Abdullah Ibrahim, mm. perhaps South Africa's most famous ever jazz musician. Mm. You know, he would be there, he said it was probably about 20-ish, plonking away on the piano. And I'd think he was just some nice guy from nearby who I could play with during my school holidays. And so I grew up in that milieu. Mm. And so it was almost a natural thing for me when I got a bit older, I started working in townships and squatter settlements of were my you, own. Were you village. based in Johannesburg? No, in Cape Town. Cape Town. Yeah. And it was so obvious in these townships and squatter settlements that the vast majority of people saw the ANC and its leaders as their leaders. These were disenfranchised people who were treated as less than human. And there was something in my blood, I suppose, that meant that I was always on the side of the oppressed from a very young age without realizing really what that meant. Mm. So I got involved in the struggle on a young, from a young age. I was sort of recruited into ANC underground structures almost without realizing it had happened. I was so naive that I just thought I was being asked to attend a meeting to discuss political strategy in an area where the police and army had burned down 70,000 shacks. Mm. And I was running a relief operation for them. I then had to leave the country in the mid eighties to avoid serving in the apartheid military. Um, and obviously had contact with the liberation movement more broadly, not just the ANC, but also the black consciousness groupings. Yeah. And I never described my time out of the country as exile because I was very fortunate to study. Where did you go? I was first in California at the University of Berkeley mm. and then at the University of Cambridge here. So that wasn't exile, that was privilege. That was more privilege <laughs> because as a white South African, that is the ultimate form of privilege under apartheid. Mm. And as soon as Mandela was freed and the ANC was unbanned, I could go home. And I had started my PhD at Cambridge and immediately said to them, look, I've got to go home. And I worked as a facilitator in the constitutional negotiations and worked with ANC structures in a variety of the transitional processes, um, education crisis, um, a situation where hundreds of ANC supporters were slaughtered in an area just south of Johannesburg. I then, I was working in Joburg at that time and in the constitutional negotiations that led to our first democratic election. And then while I was in Bangladesh getting married, the ANC in typical style announced that I would be a candidate for the election. They hadn't told me yet, but it was announced in the media. I was just one of hundreds on a list. So people were trying to contact me saying, oh, I thought you were a neutral facilitator and now I see that you were with the ANC all this time. And that caused a bit of problems actually. And then I went in first to a provincial legislature for about a year to set up economics and finance structures mm -hmm. in the economic heartland, the Gauteng province, Johannesburg, Pretoria, yes. 
of the country. Um, and then one day again, in true ANC style, I was at Davos at the World Economic Forum. I had to go with my boss, who was the provincial premier, an interesting man called Tokyo Sechwale, mm -hmm. who I wrote all his economics. So I was in the legislature chairing the Finance and Economics Committee. I also set up and for a while ran the finance, the treasury and the economics department. And I acted as advisor, economic advisor to the premier and the minister of finance. So I was playing all sorts of unconstitutional roles. In the legislature, I was supposed to be holding the department to account, but I was running the department. I was supposed to be holding the executive to account, but I was advising the executive because we just didn't have enough people with those sorts of skills early in our democracy. And then I was in Davos with Tokyo, the premier, because he was giving an economic speech and he always wanted me around if he was giving an economic speech. And interestingly, we met with Benjamin Netanyahu on that trip. Mm. And he could barely bring himself to speak to Tokyo, let alone to look at him. Wow. Yeah, it was the most, he, everything was directed wow. at me. And eventually I had to say to him, Mr. Prime Minister, I don't know if you're aware, but you're having a meeting with our premier, wow. not with me. Wow. Yeah. And Tokyo was called to see the president who had just arrived in Davos. And I'll never forget, he was sitting in this very small hotel room. Swiss hotel rooms are not often big, especially it would appear in Davos. In, in yellow pajamas on his bed, he'd arrived not many hours before. And so we walked in and he greeted us and he chatted to Tokyo. And then he said to me, Andrew, and he had, we'd had a number of issues on which we would communicate beyond the fact that he would be in our caucus meetings and things like that. Because I was a sort of of a, of a younger generation of white Jews who, who had joined the ANC and sided with the struggle. And he noticed that, so he would talk to me about issues of racism. He also was very interested in that I had links to Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And in fact- Through one, your wife? Through my wife. And he once came back from an official visit to Bangladesh, called me to his office. I was petrified I'd done something wrong. And it was to hand over a jar of guava acha ah. <laughs> that my wife's grandmother had made for us. <laughs> and she had approached the president at a dinner and told him to bring this back for us. And so, he was quite intimidated by her. She was this very tiny, very old, but very strident lady. There you go. And he handed it over to me and he said, you're canceling whatever meetings you have now. You're going home and putting this in the fridge and getting Simone, my wife, to phone her grandmother, to tell her that I've done my duty and delivered the acha. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I had those sorts of interactions with him that I was extraordinarily grateful for. But, and he said to me there, he said, so Andrew, how do you feel about moving down to Cape Town, which is where the national parliament was? This was a year and a bit into our democracy. And I said, well, so I'm actually originally from Cape Town and I, I would need to consult my partner because she's employed in Johannesburg. And he said, fine. And then he and Tokyo continued talking. And as Tokyo and I were leaving, he said to me, it's a good thing you want to move back to Cape Town because you're being sworn into parliament on Thursday. Oh my word. I was only due back in the country the following Tuesday or something. So that's the way things worked in the early years of our democracy. But it was such an honor and a privilege to serve, not just with Mandela, but with people like that, yeah. of his caliber who had given their lives for a cause, who, you know, and the greatest thing I learned from Nelson Mandela was he said to me very early on, before we were elected, when we were campaigning, he once said to me, I actually remember the, the incident. We were trying to get from a restaurant where we'd eaten to a people's forum, an event where we listen to people's concerns, which is what I'm trying to do in the constituency in this very shortened election. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, I was complaining that we were going to be late because he was you know, when he left a restaurant, he didn't just want to greet everyone who was in the restaurant, everyone who had served him. He'd want to go into the kitchen, greet everyone who'd made his food and thank the people both who made his food and who were washing the dishes. And, and as I was sort of trying to hurry him along, he said to me, Andrew, it is incredibly important in life that you treat every human being you come into contact with, with the respect and dignity with which you want to be treated. Mm. And he said, if it takes long, it takes long. And it's amazing to be in the present. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm listening and in awe because to find people whose words have actual meaning, 
exactly have real implication yeah and people who not only practice what they preach they practice and then much later on they preach they, oh it's just so they, they preach as a consequence as of a their consequence practice. of practice absolutely yeah that's that uh, you've and, got the point and, exactly and, but, right but, but that is so an antithesis to everything this is politics yeah. today of course i mean today today politics hear, is all about rhetoric you know, Keir Starmer is working class because his father worked in a factory. Mm -hmm. Well, my understanding is he either managed the factory or owned the factory or something. And, you know, I didn't speak about my own personal background until people started calling me anti-Semitic and mm -hmm. self-hating and various other ridiculous things. And then I started actually saying, well, you know, I've actually lectured at Auschwitz because that's where my mother, a survivor, lost many of her family. Whereas now people make up their family stories to suit the political agenda of that moment. And the one thing that I learned is that you are who you are. Yeah. And you have to live with your own ethics, your own principles, your own values. Mm. I landed up resigning from parliament. Mm. After Mandela had retired, his successor decided to spend $10 billion on weapons, weapons that we didn't need, because a minimum mm. of two to $350 million were paid in bribes to key ministers, to key officials, to key corporate executives, and to my own party, the ANC itself. And I didn't sign an oath to Thabo Mbeki, who was mm. Mandela's successor. I didn't sign an oath even to President Mandela. I signed an oath to the constitution of the country and to the country. Mm. And it was my constitutional responsibility to do this mm. and to pursue those allegations and to actually reveal them. Mm. And it was a very difficult thing for me to do because many of my own comrades and colleagues in the ANC who I'd known for decades thought I was a traitor for doing this. Wow. Whereas for me, it was simply a matter of principle. And of course, you know, I could do that because I had a string of degrees Mm. And it wouldn't be that difficult for me to get a job <clears throat> after parliament. Whereas for other of my colleagues yeah. who'd spent their whole lives in the movement, they couldn't just sacrifice their political Absolutely. career on a matter of principle. But I am who I am. I have views mm. and I hold them strongly. Mm. And I believe in my views and I've developed them over decades and decades of having the privilege of working with extraordinary people, some of them incredibly well-known, like Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Yeah. Some of them nobody has ever heard of, but they were as important in helping me frame and forge the views that I hold. And it's actually been such a lovely thing to start campaigning, albeit in a very squashed period of time, um, I announced the day before the election was announced, not knowing, thinking that it was going to be in October, November, and that I had a long time to get to know more people in the constituency. But to be able to campaign now as an older person than I was when I was last in formal politics and being fine mm. with expressing the views that I have and feeling absolutely no need or desire to change those views according to the person I'm speaking to. You're a local in Holborn. And yeah, I've lived there Congress. for all, almost 23 years that I've lived in the UK. But, and that's totally understandable. Yeah. And it just so happens that the leader of the Labour Party is the MP. Yeah. And that's whom you're facing. Yeah. But you could have moved a couple of constituencies away and had a greater chance of winning. Of course. And maybe then be in parliament and air your views and maybe affect change. Why this fight? Why this fight? So some people mm. have actually tried to persuade me to move to a seat where there was a more obvious chance of winning. Mm. And I thought about it and I was very grateful for the offers. But that's not why I'm doing this. Mm. I'm doing this because I'm local to my community, because I believe our MP doesn't represent the people of the constituency. And of course, because he's leader of the Labour Party, he is emblematic of the nature of our politics today. 
which as we've discussed, I have huge problems with. And there are certain things specifically, the fact that he changes his position so often. Yeah. The fact that he seems to be able to utter what we could politely call untruths or half-truths without blinking. Yeah. That make me want to set my politics against his politics. That make me want to actually stand up for a different kind of politics. And obviously I wouldn't do it if I didn't think I could win. Yeah. And there are many people in the constituency and around the country who have been very forthright in their support and their hope that I can defeat him because I think we all feel we want to change. Mm. But do we want to change to a leader who's actually not going to change anything and particularly isn't going to change the nature of our politics? Mm. So I think it's symbolically important to be standing against him. I am not a career politician. Mm. I happen not to believe in professional politicians. I think it's a terrible, terrible thing mm. because I think our representatives should come from our community and should go back to that community mm -hmm. because that's the way they best represent the community. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I went to another constituency where I had no actual link to the constituency and people were told by others yeah. that they should vote for me, yeah. I wouldn't want to be elected on that yeah. basis. Yeah. Yeah. That is not what I'm trying to convey by running this campaign. Mm -hmm. So I feel very, very comfortable running a more difficult challenge, which is against my local MP, Keir Starmer, because he is my local MP. And I couldn't imagine mm. running in any other seat now or in the future. Constitutionally? Yes. If you won? Yes. What would happen? And, and Labour won the election? <laughs> what would happen? Ah. It would be magnificent. <laughs> it would be, wouldn't it? We, we would create history. The people of Holborn and St Pancras, the people of Camden have an opportunity to create history. Yeah. And it would be constitutionally unprecedented. Yes. So a number of things could happen as I understand it. First of all, the Labour Party could somehow appoint someone as an interim leader while he try and find cause a by-election in some other seat that he could stand in and hopefully get elected. I think that's very unlikely to happen because he and his politics would have effectively been discredited. Yeah. So I think what is far more likely is that the Labour Party would have to very rapidly elect a new leader. And my hope would be that if the good people of Hobart and St Pancras felt that Keir Starmer was not perhaps the most appropriate person to be our next prime minister, that that would communicate a message to the Labour Party about what some people would describe as Starmerite politics and that they would seek to then appoint a leader who was very different from Keir Starmer, who was less authoritarian, mm -hmm. who really put the people who need a strong, accountable government committed to greater justice, to greater equality at home and abroad mm. would put someone like that into the leadership of the Labour Party. So we would have a new government, but it would actually be under leadership that was different mm. to the leadership of the Tory party. Keir Starmer could very easily be a Tory leader. Yeah. And that's the problem. Mm. And so it, it, it would be an extraordinary moment in British political history. Mm. It really would. And the fact that that might be the outcome is another reason that makes it worth doing because this is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, there are many people close to me, including some members of my family who were not happy about my running. Mm. Um, but I feel that even if our campaign doesn't end in my winning the seat, mm that you can have success without victory and that we can show a different way of doing politics and that we can show that there are many people in the area who don't support genocide, who don't support permanent austerity, mm. who don't support mendacious politics, self-seeking politics of ambition. Yeah. And that gives us something to build on, yeah. not just in Holborn and St Pancras, yeah. but across the country. Across and, the I, country. and I do think that what 
and let's call it Independence Day, mm. what the 4th of July is going to do, because we have some great independence running across the yeah. country, but it's incredibly difficult for independence to win. Why? Because the parties can effectively spend millions. True. And the Electoral Commission can't really track you know, they can produce something nationally that can yeah. be used in all constituencies. Independents can't do that. In my constituency, for instance, we can spend a total of 16,700 pounds. Mm -hmm. And that's on everything. That's on staff, that's on yeah. printing, that's on premises, that's on posters, that's on everything you can think of that you need to do, to, which is nothing. It's, 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 it really is peanuts. And that's to protect mm -hmm. the big parties. So it is very difficult. But I think if enough of us do well enough, even if we don't win our seats mm. and we galvanize people on the ground, mm. that paves the way for something incredibly exciting in our politics afterwards. Because I think what people are going to feel soon after an election, okay, so the tie of the guy at the dispatch box has changed, but nothing has actually changed. Yeah, it's a huge anticlimax. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want people to feel frustrated and to have no direction for their frustration, possibly even anger. Mm. I want that to be directed into a mass movement in this country where we bring people together, where we focus on what we have in common and we celebrate our differences and our diversities, which is what, which is what I love about my own constituency, mm. about Britain is, you know, when my son, who you mentioned, when he was born in South Africa, he was described in the media, I was still in parliament then, he was described in the media as the country's first Juslim <laughs> because of <laughs> mine and, and his mother's <laughs> backgrounds. And then you come to the United Kingdom and you see so many people yeah. who have these cosmopolitan backgrounds who are from very different backgrounds, but have formed yeah. relationships, families have joined together. Mm. And it's a, I find it a very beautiful thing and I, also have to tell you mm. that having a Jewish mother mm. and a Muslim Bangladeshi mother-in-law, <laughs> one and the same thing. Incredible. <laughs> they both, I mean, it is, you know, when they first met, I wasn't here. My mother came to London a week before we were married, which was a few days before me, two weeks actually. And I arrived and found them in, in my mother-in-law's then home in, um, in Wembley. They were literally sitting on her bed eating some sort of nonsense, watching absolute rubbish on television, some soap opera that I didn't even know what it was, <laughs> talking about their children. Yeah. And it could have been in my Jewish household, it could have been in my mother-in-law's Bangladeshi household. The other thing that's a bit difficult about that is they both think mm. or thought, my mother is unfortunately no longer with us, but thought in my mother's case, by comparison to me, Nelson Mandela's role in the liberation of South Africa was fairly marginal. That's the other thing that cuts across all cultural boundaries is the way in which parents see children. their children. Yeah, and, children it's, and it's one of, and I'm, I'm exactly the it's same fantastic. with my children it's now and it's fantastic. wonderful. Listen, so, let's, let's carry on yeah, yeah, yeah. the positive theme. Yeah. I want to know your perspective on the impact that Gaza has had on everything, including your own campaign, sure. including your decision to stand, sure. as well as, by the way, hundreds around the country. No, of course. I mean, it is absolutely remarkable that we have over 1,300 independents up and down the country, putting themselves forward and saying, we want this because we want something else. We yeah. want something different. Yeah. So, you know, of course, we first have to say, out of respect, mm. we have to say that this comes from an incredibly dark place. And one of the darkest moments that I think the world has experienced, certainly in my lifetime, where we are seeing a genocide committed against ordinary, innocent people every day on our screens. And really nothing is being done about it. And I never imagined I'd see this in my lifetime. And that our governments are not just enabling and facilitating it, but profiting from it, from the sale of the weapons that are being used, as we discussed earlier, is something 
It's sickening. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an existential moment mm. because our governments are allowing this to happen. Mm. And, you know, there's an image, and then we will get back to the positives. But before we do, I just want to say there's an image that I will never get out of my, my head for the rest of my life. And it could have been, you know, of those bodies that had been mutilated, the dead. But it's of a little girl who must have been about four or five years old who had lost her entire family. And she was on the side of the road with some just good person who had taken her under their wing and was trying to get her to cross the road. And this is the road where all of her family had been murdered. And I have never seen a human being, let alone a little child, a little girl, shaking. There was sweat pouring off her. She was just so terrified. And she just wouldn't cross the road because of this. And I thought to myself, you know, at one level she's fortunate because she still has her life. But what is this going to do to the rest of her life? She might only live a few more days. I don't know what happened to her. But I'll never get that image mm. out of my mind. And the fact that other human beings could do this to this little child, that our governments are enabling this, that the world isn't doing more to stop it, that our tax pounds are being used to pay for the weapons that have so terrified this child. It just left me feeling desolate. So I think we have to acknowledge the awfulness of this. And that's why this is an existential moment. And that's why there are 1,300 or more independents, people just standing up and saying, not in our name. This cannot be happening in our country to our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in Palestine. And that is where the hope comes from. That is where the light amidst this darkness comes from, is that all over the world, millions and millions and millions of people have been coming out onto the streets week after week after week yeah. against their governments in support of the people of Gaza and Palestine. And of course, it is the final thing that led me to take this decision because it threatens our democracy in this country because by selling weapons to Israel, our government is violating British law. Absolutely. And I know this better than most because this is my day-to-day -day work. <clears throat> and it's being allowed by our courts as well. Mm. And it's being allowed by international and regional organizations. And the fact that so many have come out to say, okay, I'm going to put myself forward. Yes, I don't stand a good chance of winning. I have very little money, yeah. but I'm just going to stand up and give people a choice. Yeah. I am going to keep these issues the focus in my local area mm. because the mainstream media is distorting the picture of what is happening so badly yeah. that we actually have to be the voice of those Palestinians. Mm. We have to be the voice of those millions around the world who find this unacceptable and detestable. And that does give me great hope. And Anas, I should tell you, I've seen a lot of darkness. Growing up in apartheid South Africa where you saw people because of their color of, of the skin being treated as less than human, mm. which in itself dehumanizes the oppressor the as oppressor, well. Of course. So you Absolutely. see an entire people, which we're seeing in Israel today, yeah. behaving in ways that no human being should behave in, celebrating the deaths of others, stamping on destroying aid meant for people who are starving to death. We had our equivalents in South Africa. Mm. But in South Africa, we overcame. Yeah. And because I saw that struggle and its victory up close, I know that it is possible. And I know that Palestine will be free. And I know that what we are seeing now by both of the major parties is the very worst of Britain. Mm. And what we will again see is the very best of Britain, where millions of us will rise up. Mm. And we will ensure that our political structures 
our political processes and our politicians will never allow this to happen again. Amen. Amen. And that's what gives me hope. Yeah. And that's why, and you know, yes, our democracy, which was for the first four years in South Africa was remarkable. <coughs> It was like nothing the world has experienced. Yeah. Everything was done in the national interest. Mm. Everything. Because Mandela reminded us of that every day. You know, one day he came into the caucus and he said to us, who here thinks you're important? And he never asked a question without knowing what the answer would be. And of course, some people put their hands up. You know, we were the new MPs in our new democracy. And he said, the moment you think you're more important than the people who put you here and the people who pay your salary is the moment you're of no value to those people, wow. to this movement, to this parliament, to this country. Wow. And that's why I'm standing. Mm -hmm. Because I think the people of Holborn and St Pancras deserve better representation than they're getting. Mm -hmm. And I think whoever our MP is, that person should be made to be in our constituency every week in person, to hear the concerns of local people that local people should be in parliament every week to see our sclerotic legislature in action. That There should be monthly report backs to all of the constituency, that before every important vote, the representative of that area should consult with the people who gave that person the vote. That's how representative democracy should work. And that's why I'm standing. But that's why there will be success even without victory because after the election, after Independence Day, <clears throat> yeah. there is going to be a mass movement in this country of people who've never been in a movement together, of people who focus on different issues, who might have different strategies, who at the moment might have different perspectives on the world, but who will come together to change the structure and nature of our politics so that the words my mother taught me mm. ring true in the world one day, never again, never again. for all humanity. You know, when, when I, uh, I tend to visit the students' encampments, yeah. and um, I was recently at uh, Birmingham University before that, and I was in Cambridge, I was in Manchester, and wherever I go, I'm seeing these young men and women between 18, 19 to about 22, 23. Mm. And this is exam season. Mm. And they are in those tents under the glorious British weather, you know, sometimes pouring down with rain. And they're studying and they're reading and they're having these group discussions about everything from their studies to the state of politics, mm. to the state mm. of Gaza and what's happening. And I couldn't escape the feeling that these are the leaders of the world to come. They are the leaders of Britain to come. They are the leaders who now are asking the right kind of questions, who are now having the right kinds of debates. Now that is something to be optimistic about. Absolutely. You know, let's remind ourselves that David Lammy mm -hmm. talking to the Republican Party in America yeah. said, Nelson Mandela would not approve of the action of these students. Let me tell you, if Nelson Mandela was alive today, he would be visiting these encampments just as he visited the campuses when he was released from prison in the United States, in Britain, in Europe, in many parts of the global South, where students had done exactly the same thing to liberate South Africa. Yeah. And many of those students Many of those students who are involved in the anti-apartheid struggle have continued to engage in struggle and to lead. But this new generation, they're something else. Yeah. Because they're having to make very real sacrifices. Absolutely. As you say, it's exam season. You know, this country's weather we won't even get into. <laughs> but the weather isn't always the greatest. I was at one of the encampments just the other night and it was pouring with rain. It was cold. And they looked miserable. And I got into conversation with, with two young women. And they were saying, you know, even just over the last three hours that we've been here, because it was their shift to be at the front table, we've been thinking, wouldn't it be nicer in our warm dorm room? And they said, but every time I thought that, one woman in particular said to me, every time I thought that, I thought, just imagine. Yeah. 
when my equivalent in Gaza yeah. would think yeah. or feel how happy they would be if all they had pouring down on them was rain. And the fact that they think this way. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is what gives us hope. That's incredible. And, I mean, and, and they will be the leaders of tomorrow because they have yeah. a core of ethics and values. Yeah. And that will be the legacy of those who've mm. been slaughtered and those who somehow survive. That will be their legacy. Is these extraordinary people around the world who've mobilized on their behalf, who they won't accept the world as it is. Mm. They will want it to change profoundly yeah. and they will change it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank that you so fantastic. much. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic.